thank you for this time that we spend together tonight. Father, I thank you for the richness of your presence. Father, I thank you for these people who have gathered tonight to worship you. Father, you said where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Father, you said if any two or three are gathered in your name, you would be in the midst. And Father, we know that you inhabit this place tonight. Father, I pray that you would open the minds and the hearts of each person here to hear what you would say to them. Father, let us put away the debris of the day. Father, all of the cares that we came in with, Father, let us set them aside. Yes. Father, let us pause in your presence to hear you, to feel your presence, to hear your voice, to feel your touch. Father, if I say it wrong, I ask that you would cause them to hear it right. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. In the year 2000, there were 957,200 divorces. 50% of all first marriages will end in divorce within the first 15 years. 10% of adult Americans are divorced and have never remarried. Between 1970 and 1996, the number of divorced people in the United States more than quadrupled. Only 25% of American households consist of a traditional family, which is a married family and their children. 9.7 million people are cohabitating with different sex partners in the United States. You say that's amazing, and yet I stand in front of our premarital class about every seven or eight weeks, and I look out at them and I say, I'm no fool. I can read the registration forms where both of you have the same address. I know that sometimes you list a message phone because you have the same phone as the person you're there with. And then I look at them and say, if you're not living together, almost all of you are sexually involved with each other. And how did we get here? The number of unmarried cohabitating couples have increased 865% since 1960. 72% since 1990. 40% of couples who live together break up. Now listen to me. 40% of couples who live together break up before they marry. And of the 60% who do marry, 40% of them will divorce after 10 years. The percentage of children in a single parent family has risen from 9% in 1960 to 28% in 1998. 35% of children now live apart from their biological fathers, and it shouldn't be so. Over 8 million children are thrust into divorced families each year. Marriages are more likely to be broken by divorce than by death. The United States Census Bureau announced in 1999 that for the first time in history, it will not be collecting data on marriage, divorce, and related matters. Bureaucrats have decided that traditional families just aren't that important anymore. A guy by the name of John Crouch had this statement to say. He said, finally, therapists and marriage counselors have come forward to say that marriages do not fail because of fate or predestination. Rather, what usually happens is that people give up on their marriages because they're not as committed to, make them committed to making them work as they could be and because no one has taught them the skills that people need to deal with the disagreements and the disappointments of married life together. We have a divorce crisis in America. We have a divorce crisis in the church. Strangely enough, the divorce rate in the church is four points higher than it is in the world. That's an indictment. If Satan wants to destroy the church, all he has to do is destroy the family. Now, what right do I have to speak to you tonight? Some of you know what that right is. Some of you don't. You see, I've succeeded and I have failed in marriage. I was married for 13 years and I got a divorce. I've been married almost 20 years now in an incredible, fabulous marriage. I'm sorry my wife can't be here. She's out of town. But we have a wonderful relationship. And if I would have known then what I know now, I could have saved that last one. But I didn't know. I didn't know what I'm going to teach you tonight. You say, was that first divorce sin? Yes, it was, because I was a believer. And I made that decision, and I didn't have what would be considered as biblical grounds. But I love it that the scripture says in 1 John that 
Loosely paraphrase, I wish you wouldn't sin. But if you do, you have an advocate with the Father Christ Jesus. And the blood of Jesus Christ still cleanses us from all sin. So what right do I have to speak to you? I have both failed and I have succeeded. Along with that, I've done somewhere between 13 and 14,000 hours of counseling as a therapist. I have a master's degree in marriage and family therapy from the University of Colorado, and I've seen almost everything there is to see when it comes to failure of marriage. And I want to speak to those issues with you tonight. In fact, why have we stopped doing what God required of us in the church? Because we've stopped doing marriage God's way. And so I'm titling this sermon tonight, Doing Marriage God's Way. I'm going to speak to you tonight on eight steps to a biblical marriage, and you might want to take a pen out of your pocket and write it down. Now, if you're married, I'm speaking to you. If you're single, I'm speaking to you. If you're divorced, I'm speaking to you. Because if you're married, you need some help in this society that we live in. And if you're divorced, you need some recovery. And if you have any interest in being married again, you need to know this stuff before you make a mistake again. And if you're single and never been married, you listen carefully so you don't have to be in the mess the rest of us are in. Somebody said marriage is like flies in summer. Those that are out, one in. Those that are in, one out. <laughs> Step one out of eight steps to a marriage that's done God's way. Number one, I would be remiss if I didn't give you this one. I came into this church nine years ago singing this song. I'll sing it going out whenever I leave it. And step number one is that your priorities must be in order. If I were to suggest that you do anything else but this, I would be suggesting that you paint your car when the engine's broken. All you have is a good-looking car, but it doesn't work. And so we're going to go after the engine first, and the first priority you must have, male or female, is your relationship with God. That is not your service to God. That is not who you are when you sing in the choir. That is not who you are when you play the instruments. That is not who you are when you're on the pastoral staff. That's not who you are when you're doing ushering or greeting. That's who you are in your personal relationship with God. That's the time you take in the morning when you sit with God's Word. You say, I don't read God's Word. It's a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path, and you are rudderless without a map in front of you if you're not in God's Word. That's who you are when you're having prayer time. That's when you are when you're getting intimate with your God. It is not who you are in your service to God. The second priority that you must have in your life is your husband or your wife if you're married. How many of you are married here tonight? You look at the person next to you. If your spouse is with you, that's your next priority. That spouse comes before the call of God. That spouse comes before singing in the choir. That spouse comes before being a pastor. That spouse comes before being an usher or a greeter or working in the children's department or whatever it is you feel like you've been called of God to do. How do I know that? Because the Bible says that I'm to love the Lord my God with all my heart, body, mind, and strength. It says I'm to have no other gods before him, so he's first. But then the Bible says in Genesis chapter 2 that for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall be joined to his wife and the two of them shall be one flesh. We're linked up together. We're one flesh. I'll speak a little more to that later. But we became one flesh, and when we became that way, I can't separate my arm and put something else in there. I can't pull my head off and put something else in between. God said it's a mystery that we became one flesh. I can't put anything else ahead of that. And I watch so many people in, in ministry that put ministry before their spouse. If my wife needs me, I'm not here I remembered, I like to tell this story, but I remember doing a singles retreat at a major conference or retreat center in Cannon Beach, Oregon. And I got up on a Saturday morning and I went to the coffee shop and I met with the people that were there, people from all over the Northwest, and we talked over breakfast, there were others at my table that I talked with, and then I spoke in the morning, and then I spoke or had lunch and people around the table at lunchtime, and it's a small resort community, and all these people were out on the streets in the afternoon stopping me, asking me questions. I spoke. That evening, after having spent time around the dinner table as well, and when I finished, there were people to talk with me, and when I finished that, it was 11.30 at night. And I went to 
my room or our room. It was the speaker's quarters, and Lori was there with me. And the bed was this way, and Lori was laying back there, and the dresser was over here. And I said, I'm emotionally and physically exhausted as I laid down on the bed. And she said, would you get up and get that over there, whatever it was? Now, my brain said, are your hands broke? Are your legs broke? Can't you get up and get it yourself? Don't you know I'm tired? But I got a hold of my brain, and I said, I'll get it. And I got up, and I went over, and I got it. Well, don't clap too soon, because she asked me if I'd get something else, and I couldn't get my brain and head together. And I said, can't you get it yourself? That time it leaked out. Can't you get it yourself? Don't you know that I'm tired and I'm exhausted? And guess what she said? She said, you have enough energy for everybody else, but not enough for me. My brain went into gear again, and it wanted to say, don't you know I'm in ministry? Don't you know you were called to walk alongside me in ministry? Don't you know that you're there to hold me up and to support me and to not have me do stuff after I speak? <laughs> Fortunately, I got a hold of myself that time because I knew she was right. Put my hands up and said, you're exactly right. You're exactly right. See, I'd put the ministry ahead of my wife. The next day looked just like that one. And when I got to the room that night, I kept some freshness so that when she needed me to do something, she didn't have the leftovers of my day. We can't do that. We cannot allow other things to come before our spot. Our next priority is our children. How do I know that? The Bible says, leave father and mother to go, and it says, leave children, but that's adult children to go to ministry. Never once did it say, leave spouse. Never once did it tell me to leave my wife to go do ministry. It said leaving father and mother, leaving adult children. But my children have to come next. Now, we get mixed up. Ladies, sometimes you get mixed, mixed up. You put the children ahead of your spouse. How many of you are from step families where you brought children together when you remarried? Those are difficult times. I know that I was a blended family, and I looked and saw pain in the eyes of my children as I put my wife first. My daughter, with tears in her eyes at age 16, told me, Dad, I've heard you stand in front of audiences and tell people that Lori comes before us. And I said, Sissy, that's right. Because I want you to know when you marry that your husband's going to come before your children. I want them to know that their spouse is going to come before their children, and we'll set up something that will be a generational blessing and not a generational curse in our lives. Now, finally, we can get the service to God. Now, you may not like this, but when I came to Heritage Christian Center nine years ago, I set my two teenage children and my wife down at the table. And I said, I'm thinking about going to Heritage Christian Center. I feel like God has called me there. What do you think? And I gave everyone an equal vote and said, unless we all go, nobody goes. Because I wasn't going to come over here and have my legs cut out from under me. We were coming together, and never once have I heard from my children, Dad, I wish you wouldn't have gone. Never once have I heard from my wife, I wish you wouldn't have gone, because we came together. And then we have service to God. I had a pastor not long ago from another city call me and he said, I need help with my marriage. Can you help me? I travel a lot and I work with pastors. And he said, can you help me? And I said, pastor, are you willing to give up your church for your wife? And he said, no way, man. I said, then call me when you're ready. Amen. It's not that God would require it, but you have to be willing if we believe what the Word of God says. And then comes our extended family and friends. This is where Mama comes. And Great Aunt Mary and Grandma. This is where they come. How do I know that? Because leaving father and mother to go do service to God, it comes before them. And then comes extended family and friends, and then would come work. Now, we're all mixed up, aren't we? We turn it over. How do you think the devil would get to me if he wanted to get to me? Stand and look at me and say, don't help people anymore? No, he wouldn't say that. He'd just come alongside me. He'd come along with a big smile on his face, and he would just take me by the arm, and he'd say, there's more work to do. We got things to do. We got people to minister to. We got more counseling to do, more people to pray for, more people to help. We've got lots to do. Don't worry about your wife. Don't worry about your kids. The call of God is on your life. We've got things to do. And that's how he would get to me. 
He would just tell me there's more to be done for God. He would never challenge me straight out. And then what would happen? You know what's happening in this nation around burnout with ministers? Do you know that 1,500 pastors are leaving their pulpits each month? Do you know that three to 4,000 churches are closing per year for lack of a pastor? Do you know that almost all pastors are discouraged and want to quit in the ministry? Why? Because they don't have any boundaries in their life and because Satan's come along and said, we've got more to do. We've got more people to touch, more people to help. And so we'll burn ourselves out at work. And then we'll go to extended family and friends and have fun with them. And then we'll come to the church and work ourselves to death. Not long ago, I was speaking up in Michigan. And I was speaking on this very topic. And afterwards, a single mom of three children came up to me. And she said, Pastor, are you telling me my life's out of line? She said, I leave work every afternoon. I go get my three children. We get fast food. We come to the church. We work till 11 o'clock. Are you telling me? My life is out of, out of whack? Absolutely. Absolutely, it's out of whack. Absolutely, it's out of line. And then we'll work ourselves to death at the church. If there's any time left, we'll give it to our children. Our husband or wife will get the leftovers, and God will get nothing. And there will be no relationship with God. And we become one more person that litters the road of failure, often at the expense of our marriages, our relationships, and our families. Step number two. Second thing we have to do if we're going to have a godly marriage is build a solid covenant relationship. How many of you know what covenant is? Do you know what it means to be in covenant with each other? I made the mistake of taking a class from Pastor Greg McDonald a few years ago, a 13-week class called Married for Life. Lori and I wanted to enhance our relationship, and the first night they talked about something called covenant. I'd never thought about it. Had a wonderful marriage, never thought about it. And that night, my wife said to me, are you in covenant with me? And I said, no way. <laughs> and she said, are you in covenant with me? Or I asked her, she said, no way. Neither one of us were in covenant with the other one. You know why? Because in the back of my brain, I had, if you do, mm, 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 I'm out of here. Or if you don't do, mm, 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 I'm out of here. I, I thought that. And we begin to challenge each other, begin to search out the Word of God about what is said about covenants. There are seven covenants in Scripture that God has with us and begin to look at what a covenant relationship meant. And in my little homespun way of what a covenant is, it's looking at my wife and saying, when you take your last breath, I'll be there. That's what it is. I want you to know I counted the cost. It took me five months and a 13-hour drive to say that to her because I counted the cost. What if she became a Buddhist? What if she became a quadriplegic? What if she got brain cancer and I had to just push her around in a wheelchair and she couldn't talk back to me? What happened if she had an affair? What happened if she became a drug addict? What happens? And for what I find in Scripture, when I walked to an altar of God and said, I do, I entered covenant with my wife and I looked her straight in the eye and said when you take your last breath I'll be there I meant it then I mean it now I'll mean it tomorrow I'll mean it next week next month next year because I counted the cost of what that means God intends for us to be in covenant I'm prone to say when I marry people when you wake up in the morning you're not going to be able to decide whether you want to be married anymore you are you never answer with what if we don't make it or what are we going to do no it's how are we going to make it how are we going to fix the issues that are between us? Because you are married when you entered into covenant. Even here where we do premarital counseling and we touch people, you listen to sermon after sermon on these issues. And the shortest marriage we've had that I know of was they married on Friday and broke it up Sunday night. I know of several that within just months they broke it up. See, marriage just isn't a coat that you put on. And when it gets out of style, that you throw it away. It isn't something when it becomes smelly. Or, you know, one thing that was really awesome for me the other day, what, my wife and I were out on the back patio of our house, and I just thought to myself, you know, 20 years later, she's as beautiful or more beautiful than she was the day we married. <laughs> so that's what covenant does to you. When she's 70, I'll be looking at her saying, she's just as beautiful as she is today. That's what covenant does for you. It doesn't leave us those other options. Stephen Annie Champion wrote a song not long ago. It's called
called the ships are burning. And he, when Aztec came to shore to fight the Aztecs, they were, he, they were deep in the heat of battle. Their backs were pushed up against the harbor where the ships were anchored. He was afraid his men were going to bolt and run and go in the ships and sail away. So he went out of the harbor and he set the ships on fire. And this author, knowing that story, penned these words to his wife. When we reached the shore, we kissed the ground. You took my hand and we turned around and we smiled as the flames lit up the night because the ships are burning. There will be no turning back for you and me. You know, there's a way that we solidify this when we do weddings, and I want to just put it together. Minister Conley and Charmaine, may I borrow you for a second? I'll just put you on this side. You know, if I were doing a wedding with these two, I would have a, a container that has some salt in the bottom of it. And there's some salt on this side and salt on this side because in the ancient Jewish tradition at the time of the Old Testament, there was something called a salt covenant. And if I entered into an agreement with someone that I didn't want to be broken, I would wear a pouch of salt around my waist. And I would take a pinch of salt from my pouch and put it into their pouch. And they would take a pinch of salt from their pouch and put it into my pouch with this understanding that the only way this covenant this agreement could ever be broken as if I could go to his pouch and I could find the exact same grains of salt that I placed there. And they could come to mine and find the exact same grains of salt that I placed there. You know and I know that's not possible. Now, one day I came home and my wife had salt all out on the table saying, I know that was mine, I know that was mine. <laughs> but you notice that there's salt in this one and that is, you know, there's a, another person that's involved when we make a covenant. And that salt represents God. And I would say to these two, I would, if I were to be marrying them, I would tell them the story of the salt covenant. And I'd say, now you've brought salt. Maybe you've brought it from your own house and you brought it together, signifying that you intend for your lives to be joined together in a covenant. And I would say to them, freeze frame the words of this pastor. Because when the going gets tough, and it will get tough, it will get tough. I guarantee you it'll get tough. You already know it's gotten tough. When the going gets tough, I want you to look at this vase after we've poured salt together, and I want you to remember that the only way that you could ever break this covenant is to be, be able to find the exact grains of salt that you placed there and to retrieve them, and you know that's not possible. Not long ago, there was a couple that had gone through the salt covenant, and they were experiencing trouble in their relationship, and the man came in to talk with me. And he came in, and we talked for a long time, and I said a lot of things. And when he got home, his wife said, what did he say? And all he said out of all that stuff I said was, remember the salt covenant. And she said it was like someone hit her in the head with a shovel, and it all changed. Because it brought back that marriage is not a choice. It's a covenant. And so I would ask the two of you to take that vial of salt. And what I would do is I would just use traditional vows, not the vows that they had said at marriage, I'd say, but I would say, Minister Connolly, do you take Charmaine to be your lawfully wedded wife, to have it a hold from this day forward for richer, for poorer, for, for sickness and health, all that stuff. And then I would pause and I'd say, and this is the key. Till death do you part. Is that what you promise? So say, I do. I have. He says, and the same to you, have you? Yes, and signify that by pouring that salt together into this container. Thank you, Jesus. That mixes with salt representing God. And actually, you guys may have done this already, but I want you to take this home and put it in a place. And I want you to freeze frame the words of this pastor that says when the going gets tough. Look at this, and you'll remember that you, your lives intertwined with God's mean that this is a covenant that can only be broken when God calls one of you home. Thank you. Amen. Step number three. The scripture requires us to establish a one flesh relationship. For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two of them shall become one flesh. You didn't have a choice. You did become one flesh. If you're married, and just two nights ago, three nights ago, my wife and I were sitting in our hot tub, and it was 
we'd been talking for an hour and a half and we were tired and I said, it just occurred to me, I said, I want you to begin to think. What does it mean to be in a one flesh relationship? It's kind of reminiscent of when we talk about covenant. What does it mean? I said, I don't even know if we're there because I'm not even sure I know what it is. So we have some preliminary thoughts. Now, I, I did a funeral a few years ago and I, I stood up there and said, I don't understand why people die. I don't understand this. I don't understand that. And, and so I got a letter a few days later that said, I appreciate your honesty for not knowing, but here are all the answers. So <laughs> if you know what one flesh relationship is, write me a letter. I'm still working on it. But I know it's comprised of bringing us together spiritually. I know that it's making our hearts beat together in a spiritual fashion. I know that we can crawl into each other's skin as we walk with God in a spiritual relationship that will tie us together if we will allow God to do that. I know that it's a sexual union that brings us together. Did you know that the latest research is saying that if your sexual relationship is good in your marriage, it adds 20% to your marriage. But if it's bad, it takes away 55 to 70% of it. You know that, don't you? <laughs> Keep looking straight ahead. <laughs> so there's a sexual way in which we come together that joins our hearts in a one flesh relationship. There's an emotional place that we come together that puts us into a one flesh. And then I told my wife, I think this is what I think. You know, there are times when I want to understand her, so I take off my glasses. And I put her glasses on so I can see what she sees. <laughs> you know, it's intimacy into me see. I open myself, allow you to see into me. And so rather than do that, maybe I look out of one eye for how I see the world. And I look out the other eye for how she sees the world. If we're one, and now I see the world in a blending of who we are. Wouldn't that be awesome? Then we would literally feel. Lori said, for me, it's when I can feel your pain and your joy at the depth of my core. Isn't that awesome? That's what God intended for us to have when he created marriage. Someone gave me an example yesterday. They said that when you take two plates of metal, you can weld them together, but they're still two plates of metal. But when you melt them and recast them, it's one piece of metal. Maybe that's what one flesh is. Step number four. Mutual need meeting in your relationship. Now, if you can establish from Ephesians chapter 5 that our model for marriage is Christ's relationship with his bride, can you do that? If you can establish that, then the Bible says in John chapter 14, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Do you remember that? Do you love him? See, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And that translates over to the marriage. That says that there's only one way that Jesus hears love. That's to keep his commandments. He didn't say walk backwards across a parking lot on broken glass on your knees. He didn't say nail yourself to a cross. He didn't say offer burnt offerings. That's how I'm going to hear love. He said, keep my commandments. And so now with my wife, she says, this is how I hear love. And I have to love her that way. So once I understand her, and the Bible says, if I say I love her, I don't do what she needs then I'm a liar. Jesus said, if you love me and don't keep my commandments, you're a liar and the truth isn't in you. And so turn to your spouse and say, I want to meet your needs. Don't be lying. <laughs> and if you don't know what they are, when you get home tonight, ask. Don't assume that you know because I'll love the way I want to be loved. If I hear love by touch, I'll touch. If I need to hear I love you, I'll say I love you. One lady said, I'm the one that writes notes and lipstick on the mirror to my husband. He doesn't like that. She wants notes and lipstick on the mirror. We must meet each other's needs in the way that we hear love. Step number five. We have to understand what biblical love is. Bishop's been preaching on that for a couple of weeks. Now, if I were to just randomly pick a couple, and I'm not going to make you do anything, but I'll... Pick these guys down here. And I'm not going to make you do anything. But if I, if I pick them and I ask one of them to say, do you ever say I love you to the other one? And they would say yes. And I'd say, say I love you and use different words. And you know what I almost always hear? It's the cards we buy when we go to the store. The card says, basically, I love how you love me. Remember the old song, I love how you love me? 
That's what we say. I love how you make me feel. I love how you hold my hand. I love how you cook my dinner. I love how you, love how you give me back rubs and head rubs. I love how you love me. But that's not what the scripture says. The scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 says this. Now, do you love your spouse? Do you do turn to him and say, I love you? Louder. She didn't hear you. <laughs> The Bible says, if I love my wife, that love is patient, then I have to be patient with her. The Bible says, love is kind, and I have to be kind to her. I want to be kind. That's what love is. 1 Corinthians 13 says, love does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. My pride doesn't get in my way. You don't say, you're dissing me. You're disrespecting me. I'm not going to do that. I don't have to do that. One night I was laying in bed and my wife was in the bathroom. Door was open between, and I was laying down, and she said, would you get up and get me something? We're back there again. <laughs> I thought I'd been around that mountain. And my brain said, are your legs broke, your hands broken? I got by the first one, she asked me again, and I said the same thing, and we kind of got in a tiff, and afterwards she said, well, you're just under a lot of stress, and I said, no. I'm the one that teaches what am I willing to do for the person I love and there's only one answer and it's anything. My pride got in the way. I'm not your servant. Who was your servant last week? I don't have to get up. Can't you see I'm laying down? What was it to me to take two minutes and get up and go do whatever it was? It was nothing. I don't even remember what it was. That's where our pride gets in the way. It's not rude. We don't talk bad about our spouse to other people. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. Man, about two weeks ago, I got mad at Lori. It's one of the just flash things where I was mad at her. And into my head, thank goodness, God is pointing his word into my head. And the scripture said, is not easily angered. And I said, oh, man, there I went again. It keeps no record of wrongs. You have to throw your black book away. Requires you to forgive. Love does not delight in ego, evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. It always perseveres. Fourteen things that the scripture says. Love is, do you love your spouse? Then were you kind today? Were you patient today? Did you forgive today? Were you quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry? See, the Bible says perfect love casts out fear, and some of us are afraid of each other. Love and fear can't exist in the same place. Step number six. You have to understand what the biblical role definitions are that God placed in his word for us. Men, can I speak to you for a minute? By the way, let me speak to singles just for a second. I want you to hear this because God's called men for us to be a spiritual leader. Bunny Wilson said something interesting in her book, Liberated Through Submission. She said, the same spirit of rebellion that will cause a woman to be sexual outside of marriage will cause her to be unavailable sexually in marriage. Now, isn't that something? Because if you will say, defy God outside of marriage, then you'll defy him inside of marriage. He said, don't outside. He just said, do inside. And all you guys that are wanting to be involved with somebody sexually outside of marriage, watch out. When you get married, it may not be what you think. And then ladies... She also said that the same spirit of rebellion that causes a man to be sexual outside of marriage will cause him not to be available as a spiritual leader inside of marriage. Because when he can't say no, when the chips are down outside, how can he say no and guide a family inside of marriage? It's sobering, isn't it? You know, Psalms 1 says, Blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is where? In the law of the Lord and in his law doth he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in its season. His leaf therefore shall not wither. And then whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. There's an if-then system in God's kingdom. If we won't do those things, men, then God will prosper us. Ladies, you have an obligation to pray over your husband every day. Get Psalms 1 out and say, Blessed is Larry. 
because he doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. He doesn't stand in the way of sinners. He doesn't sit in the seat of the scornful. But Larry's way is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates every day. I can't not spend time in the Word because my wife prays that scripture over me every day of my life. I am compelled into the Word because she prays that over me. That's your obligation for us to be a spiritual leader. And quickly, men, one piece I need to give you is sometimes God requires us to lead wounded. Sometimes we want to sit down by the road and just cry. I know because that's what I want to do sometimes. But God didn't say because I'm wounded I could abdicate my job description. My job description is to lead even when I'm wounded. I've watched people, I've watched their families fall apart around them, think that, that their courage in what they believed was ridiculous. And I've watched that person go right through the fog, the storm, come out the other side unscathed with the family saying, that was awesome because you were grounded in the word and you stayed with it all the way through. <laughs> Men, we need to be praying Proverbs 31 over our wives every day. And ladies, that's your job description. I picked out just a few things. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good. Oh, she brings him good, not harm all the days of her life. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. I wrote in my wife's Mother's Day card, I said, you are awesome as a stepmom. It's a rare stepmom that would ever hear that her children rise and call her blessed and her husband praises her in the city gates. And that's how it is at our house. Men, pray Proverbs 31 over your wife. She'll be compelled to be that person. Ladies, pray Psalms 1 over your husband. They'll be compelled to be that person. And ladies, just one little caution. The Bible says that if your husband isn't a believer, that if he wants to stay, let him stay so that he may be won by your, King James says, chaste behavior, not by your volume of words. St. Francis said, of Assisi said, always preach the gospel and when necessary, use words. Step seven, be content with your spouse. The grass isn't greener on the other side. Can I borrow a, a volunteer? Kendra, can I borrow you for a second? Do you mind? She didn't know this was coming. I just want you to stand right here, just right there. See, guys, what we want to do, ladies, sometimes you'll do the same thing. We stand and we look at the greener grass on the other side. We're not content with the person that God has given us. And so then we start seeing somebody over there, and don't they look good? And they listen to us. See, and my wife doesn't look that good, but look at her. And she listens to me. She laughs at my jokes. She'll look at me and think I'm great. She thinks I'm a wonderful pastor. She, all that stuff that we, see, my wife knows the truth. But guess what happens when I climb over and I want to go over where that other grass is. I hope I don't break my neck up here. And I come over the fence and I come over and I see a rope sitting here. And it's tied to her. So I pull it. And look at all this baggage that's tied to her. I thought she was all of that and everything else. And look at this baggage that came. It says, you can go back if you want to. It says, she brings abuse with her. You know, this one, that just got left laying along the side. It's got all kinds of stuff in it. It says, she's a perfectionist. And maybe that doesn't work well at my house. Maybe I don't want to be organized. She has alcohol problems. Control issues. Tells me how to drive. She brought problem children with her. Maybe she's a drug addict. I didn't know she liked to spend money, but she's got money problems. Doesn't pay her bills. Credit shot, took bankruptcy. Has sexual issues. I thought she was gonna be, look like that. <laughs> didn't work. She's got trouble with unforgiveness. And I need that sometimes. She's been divorced before. Brought kids with her. 
She could, hey, you're a mess, you know that? <laughs> she brought, she committed adultery one time and she's still carrying the baggage around from that. And all of her old relationship brought all those guys in here. And all the addictions that came with that. And her family, what a mess they are. <laughs> Man, I didn't know that. She had an abortion one time too. And she's really in debt. You are a mess, aren't you? You didn't know who you married, did you, Pastor Kirk? You wish you hadn't have volunteered now. See, we look, we look at the grass that's greener. Somebody by the name of Michelle Weiner Davis wrote a book called Divorce Busting, and she said she was the first non-Christian to come out with guns blazing saying, wake up, people, divorce isn't the answer. There was an article in USA Today just about a week and a half ago that said, the marriages that are in trouble, if they just write it out and work on it five years later, they're happier than if they would have gotten the divorce and tried to figure out what single life was like. The grass is not greener on the other side. Ladies, be content with the man you've chosen. See, you can, com you can pick now who you're going to submit to. After you're married, you, <laughs> you're there. What are you willing to sacrifice on the altar to the God of companionship? What are you willing to give up not to have God's plan in your life? Step eight, and I'm, I'm finished. Make God the focus of your marriage. The last one, put God in there. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 says, Two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up, but pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm, but how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Me, my wife, and God will make it. Put God the sin of your marriage. I close with this. If you keep doing what you've always done, you'll keep getting what you've always gotten. You know, there were some otters that were listless in the zoo. And they had been really active. And they called in a famous sociologist. And he came in and he watched them for two days. And he said, tie a string at the top of their cage with a piece of paper on it down below. And they did that. And one otter walked over and he slapped that piece of paper. And the other one walked over and slapped it. And the first one tackled the other one. And they wrestled and they never went back to being listless again. And somebody said, what was with the string and the paper? And he said... It was just change. It was something different. When we do something different, we'll get something different. We've got to do something different. One last story, and I'm done. Frank Wilson tells this story. He and Bunny Wilson do retreats together, and he, they live in Pasadena, California. And he said one year they were... His wife wanted to go to the Rose Bowl parade, and he didn't want to go, but he said, okay. And they wanted to be right across from the reviewing stand, so on Thursday they had to go out and begin preparation to have the space for Monday when the parade came through. So they went out and they got a big space right across and they put tarps down on it and they staked it out on Thursday night. And then he tells this story. It rained, the wind blew, their tent blew away, it ripped, they couldn't keep a fire going. They were out there just sogging wet. Somebody had to stay there. They came and went, tried to work, tried to keep somebody there, really didn't have a lot. They had no electricity. They couldn't figure out where to go to the bathroom because they couldn't have porta potties there, and it was a mess. On Sunday morning, they had various responsibilities at the church. They had to trade off by Sunday night. They were disgusted with each other, and by Monday morning, they were finally ready for the parade, just ready to get it over with. They had fought hard for the turf that they were on. And it was 7.30, and the street was actually 7.25, and the street was deserted. And they were waiting for the first float to come around the corner and go in front of the reviewing stand. 7.25, this little man comes walking down this deserted street, his chair in his hand. And he walked up to the edge of where they had their, their tarp, and there was one little spot that wasn't covered. And he said, do you mind if I set my chair right here? Frank just exploded. Do I mind? I think not. Do you have any idea what I've been through in order to get this little spot so that I can stay here? And you want to come waltzing down the street at 725 when I've been here since Thursday in the wind and the rain, not able to go to the bathroom and 
All the things that are happening. You excuse me? You want to set your chair there? I think not. I know what it's like to succeed at marriage, and I know what it's like to fail. And when you're willing to pay what I've paid, you can have what I have. And there's a price. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this moment. You created marriage. Lord, for those who are married, I pray for their marriages tonight. Lord, where healing is needed, I pray that you would bring healing. Father, for those who are divorced and lonely, I pray that if it's their desire, that you would bring healing into their life and bring them someone to spend their life with in a healthy and committed marriage by your plan, Lord. Father, for those that have never been married, let them not make the mistakes that some of the rest of us have made. Father, let these words burn into their spirit of steps that it takes to build a godly marriage. Father, I pray that you would touch each person that's here. Would you just stand for a moment, please? And I'm just going to ask you if... If this has touched your heart, if you're married and your marriage needs some help and you want to make a commitment to your spouse to do something different, I want you just to raise your hand. Would you do that? That you'll commit to do something different in your relationship. Just raise your hand all over this place. If you're single, that you'll commit to bear it to take these principles, put them into your life so that you can make a change in how you relate to other people in this congregation. Would you just raise your hand? If you raise your hand for any reason, would you just come? I want to pray with you. We're not going to be long. Just come. We gather around the altar as you make a commitment. Every, every person that Jesus called, he called publicly. And this requires you, if you make a public declaration to make changes in your life, would you come? Husband, wife, would you come? Single person, would you come? I want to pray over you tonight. I want God to bring a change into your life. I want you to do something different so that you get something different in your relationship. For you to come doesn't mean you're weak. For you to come means you're strong. For you to come means that you recognize that there are some changes that you need to make in your life and God wants to make those changes in your spirit tonight. Would you just come? Would you sing just a quick chorus while we're waiting? Would you come? If you want to make a commitment before God, you want that covenant in your relationship. You want a covenant that you're going to make the changes that it takes to be successful in relationship. I'm going to ask you to join these in the altars tonight. If you're here with your spouse, I want you just to put your arms around them. And I'm going to pray for you. And then I'm going to ask you to pray with me. Father, I pray over these. Lord, they've come expecting by faith that you would make a change. Father, that you would reveal the wisdom that you need them to have in order to make changes in their lives to produce a different outcome. Father, I know that relationship was your idea. Father, I know that marriage was your idea. And I pray that you would touch each person. Father, each person that's failed. At marriage, I pray that you would bring healing. Father, for all the debris that they brought in here tonight, Father, you would touch them and bring healing. Father, for all of the pain that they have, I pray that you would touch them. For every marriage, Lord, that there's pain in it, I pray that you would touch them. Father, some people here tonight don't even know what they're going to do. Lord, give them hope. That there is a way out, that your word is the manual, and it will lead them out. If they'll make the changes, Lord, touch them. Father, give them a marriage so that when they get to the end of the journey, they can look back and say, we'd do it all over again. Father, give them that kind of marriage. Father, for those who are single and desire to be married, Father, let them search out the word. Let them be prepared, Lord, healthy, ready to enter a relationship. Father, touch them tonight. In Jesus' name. And now I'd like you just to repeat after me, and then we're finished. Dear Lord Jesus. I repent of all the sin in my life, the rebellion that I've had against your word, 
the things that I've done wrong even when I didn't know. Father, I ask that you would cleanse me. You would set me free. Father, that you would give me the wisdom and the knowledge to create relationship that would bring honor and glory to you. Father, I submit myself to the Lordship of Jesus. And that, Father, you would teach me. And as I learn, that I would respond with new behavior that would create godly results. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.